or when you became a doctor, and um, I couldn't become the last one because I couldn't do science. So mm-hmm. I had to find out what to do, and I went for the simple choices. It wasn't you could join a business. Joining a startup was seen as very risky for the kind of majority of people or setting up your own business. Startups didn't really quite exist. And so I went that very traditional route and uh, through finance, um, then wanted to kind of really understand the commercials of the business rather than just plodding away in an Excel spreadsheet and seeing yeah. the companies were X. Um, so we want to get to know the companies and work inside the big companies. And then for me, the reason why I moved across, um, I talk about this a lot to kind of ex-colleagues or current consultants looking to, to move on, is when you're in a big strategy consultancy house, it's all about trying to kind of grow the incumbents, protect the incumbents, help them against the disruptors mm-hmm. in the industry. Um, and for me, I was sitting in a couple of these kind of strategy, long strategy cases or uh, doing commercial diligence and thinking, wouldn't it be fun to be the disruptor of the mm-hmm. industry? Wouldn't it be fun to uh, be the ones growing, fighting back against a kind of broken industries, wherever that may be? And so then I started looking, uh, looking for something that would suit my skill set. Is that because the disruptors can't afford the fees of the big consulting companies? Yeah, I think I think the consulting company wouldn't be able to help them really because they're so used to helping these big corporates manage big projects, lots of stakeholders, you know, billion pound companies. It'd be A, they wouldn't be able to afford them, and B, it'd be overkill. They wouldn't uh, know what to do. Yeah, they wouldn't know what to do. Um, and so then when you're considering what role you would take mm-hmm. in one of these disruptors, how did you end on operations? Because there's probably a few different things you could have done, right? Yeah, I guess there's probably a few things, but the trying to think what they are now. <laughs> um, I think operations was the one that felt the broadest. And for me, I kind of always enjoy working with different types of people across different kind of teams, being challenged, you know, ex- exciting thing about being a consultancy firm or is that you see lots of different things. You're not just in a company for 20 years. Um, and that's what I thought operations would give me. But if I'm being honest, I had no idea. <laughs> I honestly had, you know, looking back, I had, I saw a problem. I, I really bought into the mission that our CEO I was talking about. I'd just gone through a mortgage experience myself. It was super painful. Um, and I thought, this is this is something that I can get behind and hopefully I'm gonna figure out what the role is, what I'm gonna do, and how I'm gonna try and have some impact along, along the journey. So let's try and understand this now. Uh, the, the operations team within mm. Trussell, can you explain the structure? Because we have a sales team selling to consumers, mm-hmm. And then there's this operations part, like what the commercial teams in Trussell, how, how can we understand? Yeah, so we're, we're 130 people now, um, but we weren't, when, you know, especially when I joined and before that, and it was never really thought of as a sales team. Even internally, we wouldn't really necessarily call it a sales team. We're trying to get the best advice to... It's advisors. Uh, yeah, mortgage advisors. We're trying to get the best advice to, to consumers who are coming to us either to remortgage, purchase, um, to either save them money or give them the best, ex- and also to give them the best experience that they can have. And in that sense, we weren't a traditional sales team in that sense. In fact, we were fighting back against what can be in the mortgage industry, a sales team that goes after the revenue of a, you know, of a customer and says, oh, I'm not going to help you because your mortgage is too small for me. I'm not going to help uh, you, or I will, but I'll charge you a fee. We wanted to break that and say, if you've got a fifty thousand pound mortgage, and if you've got a ten million pound mortgage, it's, it's that's one each. Um, and so in that sense, we weren't really the sales model. And the, the person that hired me, who you know, I look up to, was a, a VP of operations. We didn't have a concept of sales, and he was growing out a team trying to work out, okay, if we have a mortgage advisor here, how do we make them as efficient as possible? And so for us, a kind of traditional sales enablement is advisor productivity. How can we say that one of our team members can help five times, six times more customers than a traditional mortgage broker yeah. sitting in a state agency or on the high street? And therefore, it's about productivity, which is kind of cost efficiency as opposed to revenue growth in that sense. And it's about volume of customers helped rather than, which obviously has a, a pound value to it, but it's, it's not the lumpy B2B Kind of model, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, are you saying that we can't, in this discussion, we can't treat advisors as salespeople? Like, as we're talking about how you work with advisors, mm-hmm. are the lessons there applicable to sales people in, say, a SaaS mm-hmm. company? Do you think or not? 
I think um, so. I, I, I think we've gone on a journey. Um, as you know, we've had a VP sales join uh, in January, Tom Glasson, and um, what he's tried to do is professionalize our approach to kind of mortgage advice, taking the best of our customer experience with also having a repeatable process that we can we can scale. Um, and so I think there are definitely lessons across that. You know, you know, one example would be. And we, and we, I think we have a lot of the common challenges. Ultimately, we want to know, you know how many mortgages are we, uh, how many customers are we going to help this month, next month, three months time? That's you know, forecasting. What is the performance of each of our kind of mortgage advisors? How do we incentivize them in, in, in the right way to produce the right results? How do, we motivate, how do we motivate them? How do we have the right setup so that they're set up for success? How do we take tasks away from them to make more efficient? How can we... So, you know, ultimately it's the same thing, but it's, I think the nuances of a B2C environment versus the B2B make it quite different, even yeah. though fundamentally you're both trying to get a result for the customer, whether it's a big, you know, uh, uh, whether it's a company or, or, or a consumer. Got it. And this is actually the first B2C company we've had in. Um, mm. So just before we move on to the questions, 130 people in total, what for the size of the advisor team and then the size of the operations team supporting them? So we have um, so about uh, we have about sixty people or so that I would constitute sitting in what we have a broad spectrum of, of kind of sales and operations. And really within that, you've got your your mortgage advisors. We then have a support team um, that help the customer through the second part of their journey, which we call case managers. We then have separate kind of operations roles to create efficiencies along the way, um, uh, as well as a customer experience and a customer success team. Yeah, well. Uh, and then se separately, uh, our data team sit within kind of data engineering, um, mm -hmm. but then there's a crossover and uh, you know a key stakeholder into that in, into that data team. So, is there a sales ops function? No, but um, really, I kind of I guess our structure at a top top level is um, kind of a head of ops, a head of sales, a head of customer experience, um, and and that as a group is kind of how we kind of try and get the the best of the customer. Got it. And you are head of customer experience? The ops. The operation yeah, side operations. of that. Yeah. Uh, so for there's, sorry, it's sales, customer experience, and ops. Ops, got it. Awesome. Um, so can we now move into questions? So technology that you guys mm. are currently using to manage this, yeah. this big map of people. Mm. So we have um, many more customers than a <laughs> size. Yeah. Um, we have about, you know, tens of thousands of signups or 10,000 visitors to our website every week. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of volume uh, game that we have. Um, and then separately, we receive lots of, so, you know, customer comes to our website, very simply, they sign up um, either on a remortgaging, uh, remortgaging journey or a uh, purchase journey, you know, their, their first, first home that they're buying uh, or the next home that they're buying. And through that, they essentially kind of sign up, give us some basic information, and then fill out a form, a kind of longer form that takes about 15 minutes. And this really is a customer giving you their life story and saying, this is me, this is my partner, these are my dependents, um, this is everything that you need to know about me. We then have technology that allows us to do a, to do a soft credit check, receive um, kind of data, and we go into all the different sources uh, around properties and things like that to build up a picture of that customer. And that is a lot of data points, uh, a lot of highly confidential data points as well. And so um, managing all of that information, obviously that information is changing over time as we change our product, uh, is a huge challenge. Um, I can go into that. <laughs> <laughs> but then the, the, the internal technology that yeah. you're using to try and keep track of those customers mm. and then make the advisors efficient. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, we made a decision uh, a few years ago to essentially build our own proprietary CRM style system. And in that, we have our, our sourcing system, uh, the way that we keep track of the customer journey. And that was very good for a while, but it's becoming, you know, it, it gets more difficult to use and requires, oh, I need to make this change. I want this to be, uh, you know, you are adding to an engineering backlog where you're thinking, could I be, if they weren't doing this, could we be doing something else? And so we are evaluating whether we should be thinking about getting an external um, system. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to use the S word. <laughs> I'm not using the S word um, or equivalent. Um, but separately to that, we um, so have our own proprietary system. 
And then we have the way that, and that's how we manage our internal workflows. Yeah. We have a separate communication system. So we talk to our customers via email, live chat, and telephone. Mm -hmm. And so we have three different stacks there. Um, and all of this feeds into essentially a central data warehouse. Mm -hmm. um, and we, you know, we used to be a free user of Metabase, which is the way that we get data out. And now we've gone to much more self-service in the company. We started using Looker uh, recently as a way to kind of manipulate data and, mm -hmm. and get real understanding out of that. But yeah, quite a complex stack. Yeah. Uh, that, we're, that we're looking to, to simplify, but it's one of those things that as the company evolves, you kind of pick the path of least resistance to get you set up in what you need to do. Are you, are your team responsible for deciding what kind of like, you, you're saying about potentially moving to the S-word, is that your team who are driving that? So we're not thinking moving to the S-word, we're not <laughs> moving to the S-word, I don't think. Um, the, uh, Yes and no. Um, I'd say that we are a stakeholder in it, but actually it's being led by the CRM team separately, uh, okay. which traditionally might be part of kind of, yeah. a kind of ops kind of view. But it's, I think the commercial relationships have traditionally kind of sat with me. So, you know, when we negotiate our contracts with, with these vendors, sat with me as we think kind of about what the greater eco kind of system looks like as our product expands, you need to get more than one person involved in that. Um, and it's we've recently hired a kind of head of CRM who's managing that life cycle. He's got a lot of experience in those vendors. You know, yes, your Salesforce, your HubSpot, your Freshworks, etc., as well as the, the, the long other list that he will be leading on that uh, that project, uh, which I'm quite happy for. <laughs> <laughs> um, now I want to focus on the advisors. Mm -hmm. um, what's like one thing that you've done that's had like the biggest boost in productivity for them? It's a really good question. Um, I've spoken about this. I've spoken about this before. But um, Tom and I um, got together, and we thought we're having, we're realizing that we were trying to, we're having pressure from the business. So we, you know, we keep needing to be great. And how do we motivate a group of people who, um, you know, are always fixed resources? They've got inbound customers coming. You know, they're not calling out and saying, "I'm going to need to make this many calls, this many appointments." We have, you know, they're handling. I won't give the numbers away, but a significant volume of customers each month are coming into us who want help from us. And we want to give them the best service as quickly as possible at the most convenient time for those customers. And yet we're saying, look, you, you have X many customers coming in. This is your funnel. How many of those um, do you think you have the ability to get to Y? And the way we're doing it is saying, okay, well, based on, we're doing this very complicated model that says based on the customers we had three months ago, two months ago, one month ago, based on what we know the Kind of conversion curve looks like and how long it takes for people to move. What is the kind of target conversion rate that we're trying to get you know, get to to make our kind of our, our numbers look better at you know, the next board meeting? Okay, equals this number. So we we need to get this many customers submitted to a lender to get them that certainty that they can get their mortgage on. So we have that number. How many people do we have? What holiday are they doing? Okay, so if you're on holiday for one week, we're getting this. If you're not, it's that, et cetera, et cetera. Here's your number. That's the traditional way of doing it. Yeah. Here's your target, commit to it, yeah. and off you go. So we started to think about this, and we said, hold on a second, and we were reading around, um, you know, we um, had, a, had, a, had a great presentation from um, Dimitar from Heresy, yeah. um, who is all about the burnout, burn down chart. Um, so essentially, you have your kind of target for the month, and then you can kind of track it. Essentially, using that agile sales. You know, so I was speaking to you about that mm -hmm. before one of your uh, topics. But we said, why? What happens if we take a risk? We say to the team, your choice. What number? Um, how many? How many customers do you think you have the ability to help this month? Bear in mind that we're a growing business, and we want to push our productivity, what could we do that could improve that? So you've said it's X, you know, let's say it's 50. What would you need from us to make it 55, 60, 65, 70? And we said to them, yeah, the target this month, we don't know. And um, you've got three days, sit down with your kind of your sales manager, have that discussion, um, and, and tell us why you want to hit that number. Um, and what we found is that it was very weird at the beginning. Um, I think the best quote I had was, is it a trick? <laughs> it wasn't a trick. Um, but ultimately, in the first month, the number that we came out at was 5% higher than the model number without telling anyone what that number was. And then if you, if you divide by giving it themselves, yeah. then 
that number would have been 5% lower than the number when we added it all up, or yeah. what everyone gave us. And the psychology behind it is also that you're much more likely to overachieve a target that you've set yourself and believe in than a target that someone else has given to you. If I said you need to call 20, if you, you need to, uh, whatever, close 20 customers next month, or if I said to you, you said to me, uh, I'm going to close 18 this month, I'd probably think that you'd get to 20, mm. if you see what I mean. Because they have ownership of the goal. Yeah, and so really what we're trying to tap into there and kind of subscribe to is this kind of down pink model of, of um, kind of within Trussell. How can we give our employees autonomy? How can we ensure that they can get mastery over their kind of part of the business? And how do we really tap into the purpose? Like, what, why are you here? Why do you want to turn up to, to work every day? How can we use that as a motivator rather than this kind of carrot stick of, you know, you're, you're in trouble if you don't hit this number or, or pay you lots on this because it doesn't work. Um, and it just it isn't a sustainable growth platform. So focusing on people and giving people the comfort and the certainty of how we, we compensate people and how we do performance management, but with the autonomy that they set what they're going to, they want to achieve. Yeah. Maybe with a bit of nudging sometimes, it's really powerful. And so, so what they said they were going to achieve was slightly higher than what you would have forecast. Mm. Can you share how they actually performed? Like, did they actually go then and beat the target? Or with the yeah. coming lower. So um, we we now we've been doing this since May, and I have and every day I kind of update it. Um, kind of you can you can get software to do this for this. You can actually do it super easily in Excel mm -hmm. and have some automatic charts come from your database, and uh, I can see on an individual basis what everyone's kind of burn down is. If that makes sense, we call it kind of velocity. Mm -hmm. um, I see it at team level. At the beginning, it was kind of when you look at it backwards, you can see these gaps opening up. Then now we're kind of Nice and smooth. Nice and smooth, they're all going underneath it. And so, um, yeah, it's really exciting to see. Now, focusing on advisors still, bringing new advisors into the business, mm. I assume you've probably done over the last few months, mm. how do you get them up to speed and productive as soon as possible? Really good question. Um, we thought about this quite a lot, and what we did before is we had kind of three squads of advisors. and. Um, with fairly new kind of sales managers in those squads coming team leads. And three new joiners come, you get one, you get one, you get one. Take them under your wing, show them, you know, our fairly complex systems and there's some compliance systems, you know, it's not, it's different from being on the high street. You've got to speak to someone on live chat. You know, if you fill out our profile, we say skip the queue, you can talk to us right now. These voice brokers before, a lot of them had been working in high street agencies where someone comes in the front door. It's very different. Um, and that wasn't really working because there was just a, such a difference. There was no playbook. There was no, this is our process. It was very iterative and different. If you're in squad one, you do it this way. If you're in squad three, you do it that way. And if you're in squad two in that way, and if you move someone between the squads, God, it's a nightmare. So what we did is we, we hired a new team lead in, you took over one of the teams from, from a competitor actually, and then we set up an academy. Um, and we set up essentially a training squad. You come in and you have an onboarding program, one person, and then about one to two months in, um, you'll essentially be released into one of the kind of normal squads, okay. if that makes sense. But you have a kind of high intensity period of learning. Okay, which is with real customers. With real customers. Okay but where you have the dedicated attention of one person who's not having to manage kind of all the other experienced people around and coach those. One person, you've got your kind of network of peers around you are also going through the same thing. Ah, got it, yeah. And at the same time, you'll shadow people of the squad that you're going to go into so you can kind of have a smooth transition in. Yeah. Um, I, and did you see the ramp, like time from nothing to fully productive increased after that? Um, yes, I think it has. I think we're still going to see it see it come through and yeah. um, it's definitely giving people more confidence and a much more structured base cool um forecasting mm -hmm. number of more digital revenue does that fit with your team or does that fit with somebody else no. so kind of operationally planning so i know um so obviously we're a vc backed company we've got a five-year model um and you know that's something that we're iterating that's you know head of finance ceo and that then you know, a key part of that is your operational plan behind that, which says kind of you know what volume of customers do we want to come in the front end? So working with a kind of head of head of growth, 
marketing. Um, and then also, um, what is our hiring plan underneath that? And I guess I kind of, that's something that I drive, um, yeah, in the business in, in terms of that, yeah. Okay, so forecasting, so that's actually your responsibility to say, this month I think we're gonna hit like 1,000 mortgages. mortgages. Yeah, that's okay, cool. And how are you like getting the data and feeding that into the model? So for us, I guess it's fairly stable. It says we want to say that we can do X per advisor, and we know that we're going to be challenging the team to get to an average of X, mm -hmm. and we know how many customers, uh, and we know how many advisors we have. So it's kind of a time zone of the numbers, and it's back calculating how many customers do we want each of those advisors to handle each yeah. month so they don't have a huge pipeline, they have a manageable pipeline, which is an efficient from a marketing spend perspective, right. and just putting all of those bits together, and then we kind of sit down, myself, the CEO, uh, Tom, marketing, finance, we sit down, and that's kind of the fusing okay. together, and we try and stick with that plan. We have a kind of clear saying, for the quarter, we want to achieve this. Um, there's almost a thing that the growth is really important, but actually the kind of productivity per advisor is kind of an almost more important number to our, um, to our investors, if that makes sense, because, if you have a productivity of X, it says like, once you start improving your productivity exponentially, it's just a question of being, kind of hiring more people and you times by that number. Whereas if you are growing your top line number and you had to hire exponentially more people to the team, then that's not efficient. If that makes sense. Got it. So you, would you say one of your core focuses is maximizing the number of mortgages an advisor can deliver or yeah. sell if we don't want to use the term mm -hmm. in a month? Yeah. That's like the core thing. Mm. Cool. What can you share? Like another thing that you've done since you since you've been a trustful that has had a tad, like a real impact on the productivity of an advisor. Yeah, so we've done a few overhauls of our systems and kind of our processes. Um, the and there's a product things as well, and like the product team, you know, do a lot of things that enable us to be kind of quicker, more efficient. Anything from changing how we position our club live chat pop up that says you finish fifty minutes with us. How can we know that if we engage with the customer as quickly as possible, they're more likely to come with us and not with someone else? Because someone else is ringing them, they're filling out a form elsewhere. So how can we get more people into our kind of more instant version? It can be as simple as me, an engineer and I sitting down for a day with a designer and saying, how can we create the most impactful kind of text here that says, make someone want to click on a button to talk to us kind of live? Okay. I think the most impactful, another impactful thing that we've been doing is really breaking down the task of what someone is doing. It's a regulated role. Um, you know, our mortgage advisors are highly qualified. They've all passed regulated exams, something called a CMAT. And picking out in that kind of like A to Z of the mortgage journey, what is actually a regulated activity? What's not? Where could you get support on? What is just kind of really the frustrating parts of their job? And saying, okay, how can we hire quickly to take away, it might be data entry, it might be, um, rotating documents, customers send us documents in all different forms. We need to send them on. Yeah, someone that's well paid, kind of one of our well paid advisors, should not be kind of cropping, rotating, flipping, etc. etc. And so, we what we did there is we said, Look, we, we'll try and do this as, as quickly as possible, and then we'll work out how much of an impact is having after that. And so, we, we use an agency. Um, I, don't if, I don't know if I should be kind of like. <laughs> take out the names. We use an agency where I could hire someone really quickly, great online platform, a company called Hey Tempo, um, where we can hire someone, get them in on Monday to perform this role. It's a basic role, and we just want someone that's committed, and we can just extend that contract on. So in the end, we hired four people who are fantastic, two of which are staying on. They can be converted all four onto a kind of contract with Trussell. Um, and that meant that we could take away a significant volume of tasks to make the speed from customer to kind of lender quicker, yeah. but also more efficient. Got it. And so there are tasks that your mortgage advisors don't have to do and shouldn't be doing, mm. and though you've extracted them, so yep. you can fit more mortgages into there. Yeah, so they can help more customers and do what they're best at rather than what they don't want to be doing. Got and obviously then they get more job satisfaction from that because they're doing more of what they want they want to do and they love and not what they don't want to do. Guys, um, what do you think is the most insightful metric that you use? Mm. Conversion, most insightful metric. Or maybe the most useful. I 
think when it really comes down to it, the most important metrics in your business is really understanding your unit economics. Um, so for and, uh, and that's kind of not necessarily like a sales ops thing or an ops thing, but it, it's what you kind of have to relate everything back to because you can have one metric that you can over-focus on that might come at the expense of something else. And fundamentally, what are you trying to, your investors have come to you because they believe in your product, they want you to have as many customers and fix a problem that's out there. But at the same time, there's only so much putting money on a fire that a, a classic VC investor wants to do. They want to say, is this going to be a company that can grow and be profitable and therefore you can keep your employees employed and help more customers? So, you know, our unit economics are, our revenue, minus cost of acquisition, minus our cost of sale. Um, and so you know, how much is the, the cost of acquisition? What is the cost of a completed customer that's gone through a very complex journey? Um, cost of sale, how much does it cost us to produce the volume that month? And that you get your gross margin. And if you look at those in isolation, you say, oh, I'm not gonna do this because um, it's really bad on cost of sale. You might be saying, oh, look, this type of customer is super expensive uh, for us from a cost of sale perspective. But if it's super cheap to acquire, it might net itself off, if you see what I mean. And so having a holistic view of your unit economics, making sure everyone knows what unit economics actually means. We have a thing on Slack now where you can do forward slash tell me unit economics. Yeah. And, and across a number of different kind of actions in the company that uh, one of our Shireen, a company she, she built it. Um, so that's the most important thing. Because if you don't know how you actually make money or the path to profitability, then you don't know if you're not making the right decisions. Got it. And final question, who in the world of operations uh, yeah. would you, or have you learned the most from? I'm going to be really difficult and not say kind of one person, because I think the best thing about a startup, especially a small company, and especially operations, is that you have kind of the ability to interact, make decisions with, learn from people across all parts of business. Before I joined Trussell, I didn't know my SEO for my SEM. I didn't know my SQL for my Python. Um, and I, I didn't know what to control F in all the contracts that I <laughs> had to look through quickly before, before I had a legal look through. And so the, and I certainly didn't, didn't know that I had to install the projector in the ceiling as well when we moved office. So I think everyone's an influence along your, your journey. I couldn't really pick out the individuals. I think um, really investing in a startup and what the technical engineering side means, what, how they work, what the schedule is, what you can do to make things easier, and understanding that process is super useful. Um, I think the most valuable, um, you know, one of our senior data engineers, really be able to crack problems, say, look, I want to understand this about our customer. Like, what do they, we ask questions like, what is the best time for a customer to create their profile in a week? We have people create their profile at 2 a.m. What is the best operational time for them to create a profile? How do we, rethinking about not when, what hours we want to work, but what's the best for our customers? And really sitting down and tackling those problems is exciting. What is the best time for someone to fill out their profile? Not yeah, yeah, I didn't say it. All the times. All the times. All of them, yeah. All of them. Um, so that was super interesting. It was, it was more holistic than we normally do, which I think mm -hmm. is good. Um, things I liked, the having advisors actually set their own target, I think is brilliant, and I'm so glad that it worked. And I, I really agree with Purpose, Mark, or Tommy, and Mastery for sure. So I'm really glad that worked out for you, and I thought that's fantastic. Being really analytical about what your advisors are actually doing and stripping out stuff they mm -hmm. need to do, I think, any, like that's not even, even for sales, like any manager should really be looking at that and what your key resource is doing and what they not need to do. Mm. And then the final point of the last thing you said that's in my mind. Um, but there are lots of people. Uh, no, no, it, it was one before that. What the question we asked was, oh yeah, no, you know, you know economics. Mm. And that's so for, for sure, because when we went about people before in this podcast, they'll say one specific metric and your point about over-optimizing on that one could make that sales mm, absolutely good at the detriment of somewhere else in business. And so that, I think, again, for any person any person working in any business, if you have a better understanding of that, you're going to be more valuable to the business as a whole. So, Philip, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much for having me on.